Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast. Today I'm here with Trevor. Trevor I'm here with Trevor Ewan, CEO, engineer, and partner of an acquisition fund. Man, thank you. Uh, I don't know why I can't ever get through the name part without stumbling just a little bit, but thank you for being here today. And uh, let's just uh, um, where are you located at right now? I think you're in New York, right? Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me, Ron. By the way, I uh, am normally based in New York. I am in. Uh, kind of quiet part of Southwest Virginia at the moment, which is okay. where some of my family lives. So I'm just down here visiting them and we're having some time in the countryside. So uh, cool. So let's just get started, man. Uh, the, I always like to joke around and say, hey, you were born and then you ended up on a podcast about buying and selling businesses. Could you fill out the gap in between? So how did you get started and how did you end up on an acquisitions and mergers podcast? Sure. Well, I think I ended up here because uh, you were great to reach out, and uh, it was clearly a good fit, but I can talk about why it's a good fit, and that goes into some of my background. I guess the easiest way to put it is, you know, entering the work world, I got into software engineering at a time when having a job was sometimes hard, uh, right after the Great Recession, but also at a time uh, that software engineering hadn't really hit its its peak in the U.S. A lot of people thought, oh, it's kind of a dying job here, it's all going to be offshore. And what happened is that became ever and ever more relevant to businesses. We saw a big, big uptick in both kind of rates, opportunity, but also just the rhetoric around people learning how to code. Uh, around 2013 was when I started to hear a big difference around that. So it was really lucky in a way because I, I kind of step, stepped into a career that fit me, uh, but also had a lot of tailwinds really that have been going in the last decade. And so... You know, I think as an individual contributor and then eventually managing teams inside of a larger context, like a corporate context, eventually you say, what's next? And in 2021, my partner and I decided to break free from both of those contexts for ourselves. And so we, we have a dev firm, which is called Southport Technology Group, and then we have an acquisitions fund called Southport Ventures. And I think we, we see this kind of emerging software acquisitions market as a pretty exciting thing to do, and it matches our stage of life kind of matches our temperament as well. So that's why I'm here. How do you feel that the uh, the recent changes in the economy, the uh, the stock market going down, the inflation going crazy, how do you think that's going to affect your ability to acquire great companies in the near future? Right. So it's it's tough for us always because I say we're, we're playing either side of the table because on one hand, we are working with sellers and of course we would, be fine if their prices came down a little bit. And similarly, we are also working with investors and sometimes they get a little bit, uh, you know, scared of the market, especially if they've got a big public exposure or they're a little worried about where the market is headed or they're also making strategic shifts. A lot of what we've heard recently from people on the funding side has been one of, Hey, we're, you know, we're doing fine, but we're kind of in a wait and see mode. So I think it it could be tough because the point of concern shifts a lot. I think, for much of 2021, we were dealing with valuation expectations that we thought were a little rich. And now we're just on the other side of that. And I think we've got we've got sellers who aren't that much more motivated, but certainly more open to that. And then similarly, the money raising side changes a bit. So you have to you have to be agile. You have to be ready to move. I'll say this. We're we're looking in a bit more durable markets. So we're not looking at the kind of thing where any of our sellers would be willing to say cut their prices in half or even do something much more than a 10 to 15 percent change it's interesting is uh that's the shift it made for me as i started looking for it you know i don't believe anything is recession proof but what is resi- uh, recession resistant what are people going to going to buy or do no matter no matter what the economy does right yeah. and uh you know they're going to have to have their business up and running so there's certain business services they're going to need so i think that's a great area in your in your realm for me i like you know, recurring revenue subscription models, same way you use SaaS. But uh, I like a little bit of the brick and mortar too. So I've been looking around at different like coffee roasteries, right? People are going to drink their coffee, whether they, yep. <laughs> whether, whether they uh, have a bad economy or a good one. I would say that, you know, bars and liquor sales don't change too much during that. Either you're celebrating or you're done, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, just not yeah, interested in the, 
Yeah. I'm uh, not interested in the culture I'd have to be around because I have two young kids if I owned either one of those. So uh, the uh, I, I think what's going to happen here is I think a couple things could happen. Money's going to get a little more scarce. So if you're not sitting on your own cash, um, scared money, there's, I mean, there might be some scared money coming you know, down the, the pike, meaning it's harder to get access to capital. The other thing is the mul- because of that, the multiples are going to come down. Um, I think that, you know, some of the multiples, especially in the software industry, some of them are high and, uh, that I think there'll be an adjustment there. That's my gut feeling, but well, well, I guess we're in a wait and see mode. Um, a lot of people think during the recession is the best time to either start a business because it trains you on how to, to run a business when it's, you know, everything's not great. And, uh, and others think it's a great time to buy one because people just don't want to go through another, they're, you know, they're, they'll be ready to get out. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. And I think that 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 will vary a lot with the kind of life stage of the seller, which is it's interesting, right? Uh, on one hand, in software, you deal with a younger seller set for sure compared to say Main Street businesses, business services, that kind of thing. But even so, we found people they're not say ready to retire. You know, maybe that's a term they've reserved for you know thirty years away, but they are ready for something new. Uh, it's a bit of a grind. It's a bit of a slog. And one of the things that I think people underestimate about the kind of growthy market that we've just lived through is it's very taxing on people, right? So uh, having to perform at that high level and having new entrants, well-funded new entrants always enter your market can be a lot. So we're very focused on that. I mean, this is kind of a truism in the acquisitions world, but we've we've lived it out, you know, as much as we didn't think it was always the case initially is, okay, there's the financial reason you're selling and then there's the non-financial reason. And we are going to have a much more interesting conversation if we can get to alignment on the non-financial reason. Now, when you say B2B, uh, software, software as a service and stuff. What type of, are we talking like accounting software? What, what kind of things are you looking for? Yeah. So we, we like vertical market software. Accounting would be a bit broad. Uh, although we'd be, we'd be open to accounting platforms that targeted specific industries, maybe for a regulatory or uh, kind of like industry complexity region. Uh, but we like niche markets. So, uh, focusing in on say, I'm trying to think of some of the ones we've done. Uh, recently. So scheduling software in medicine, we looked at uh, asset management software for industrial and construction oriented industries. Uh, We've looked at some government services that work specifically with state governments. We work with clinical trials software, you know, a lot of these where your, your defense in the market should be that Google, Amazon, kind of the big, the big tech giants are not looking to just make this into an add-on market. And it's specialized enough that there's that kind of certain durability, stickiness in the markets. Uh, frankly, we like it too. It just as a, as a product management challenge, I think we're, we're uh, interested in the idea of working in markets where your actual way to win is to build the best tool for the uh, sophisticated practitioners in the market. So I like that when you, when you get down into a niche you know, uh, area, you can provide tools that just the general tools just just are going to miss and are quite frankly not relevant to the the big you know uh, scheduling software and stuff because it's not a need across you know every client so i get that i uh, i think that's a, a brilliant place to, to to stick um so do you what do you do when, let's just talk about the process you uh, let's start from the beginning right uh sourcing and then we'll kind of talk about what you do once you've you know acquired one What's the onboarding? How do you, uh, you you have some ideas around automating some of this stuff? So let's start with just sourcing. What do you what do you do to like to go find uh, the next business to acquire? Right. So I think it's you know worth the standard uh, kind of disclaimer here. It's going to vary widely based on the market. Although I do think you can you can take the same kind of uh, methodology, top of funnel approach. The other thing I'll say is these these ideas uh, can feed right into uh, an outbound sales strategy later. So it's a really good thing to learn. Sometimes I think people can talk themselves out of getting good at sourcing. Cause they're like, Oh, I only have to do this once. And then once I source the deal, I can just run it, but it's actually going to be a super useful thing for just realizing how to identify targets and go find them. In our case, we have, we have an advantage and disadvantage, uh, which always seems to be the case, right? So the advantage being we are entirely interested in fully remote tech businesses in the U S and Canada. And they, by definition, will have some kind of online presence. So we can rest assured that, you know, looking online is going to be the method of sourcing. And then also emails is going to be a pretty fairly 
reliable way to reach owners. Every now and then we'll give owners a call too. We're not opposed to that if they do have a phone number available for us. But so it's it's a very, I guess you could say, digitally friendly strategy to run. And what that means is sourcing different verticals at a time. So we'll source different batches um, by scraping just uh, general listing sites, usually not for the purpose of sourcing. So a lot of these companies will market themselves to potential buyers. Uh, and, and we don't mean buyers of the business, but buyers of the actual product, the software that they're selling, right? right? So finding those marketing channels are a great place to source companies from. Then we do an exercise in right-sizing them. It's, you know, fairly, it's a fairly blunt instrument, but we're really looking at headcount as a way to decide, okay, this is the size of target we're looking at. And then we do proprietary outreach to the owners. Big thing. These are standard tips you'll hear, but we, we focus on short, plain text emails, uh, making sure the owners know about our backgrounds, the people, the fact that we're in tech and we're not just, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a generic PE buyer. And right. then just make sure we, we get them on the phone as quickly as possible to actually talk about the situation. And, you know, it's good. You have to you have to go pretty wide for top of funnel. Uh, but we have been outperforming some of our initial estimates in terms of actual conversations. A lot of it is making sure that first call is really efficient to uh, disqualify the business, which very often happens. And one of the best treats about it is that people who disqualify themselves early or who don't respond early, they still keep the email around. They'll keep it handy. And so sometimes, you know, we've seen a few responses nine months to 12 months after we sent the original email, which is always interesting because um, you almost assume in that situation you, you're dealing with someone who's a little bit more strategic about what they're doing because they are have been actively thinking about this for some months at a time and not just quickly responding to you. It's interesting that happens with direct mail all the time too. You'll you'll send a batch of direct mail out, and uh, especially like when I was in the real estate space, we're sending out a batch of direct mail, and uh, I would do zones. So we would target a particular neighborhoods for a while or whatever, and or uh, you know sometimes whole counties if it's a smaller county, and then we wouldn't come back to it for a you know six months to a year. And we a, a year would go by, and I get an email or a letter or a call that said, "Hey, uh, I got your postcard." And then when we get to their address, they're like, I haven't sent you a postcard in, you know, in 11 months. But yeah. they, they keep it and they put it on their counter. You know, it's like, you know, one of these days they know they're going to need it. I think the same thing happens. They probably, you know, star your email and say, hey, you know, thought about selling it before. If I ever think about it again, you know, I have it. So contacting you later is but very strategic because they're, they're, they've already kind of got that. It, you know, I think the same thing. I think those, those tend to be a little more motivated too. Uh, they're not what I call... Uh, you know, uh, looky lose or whatever. I, I sure. you know, a lot of times you reach out and to somebody say, Hey, I'm looking at buying businesses. And they're like for 5 million, I'll, I'll, I'll sell you my business. And uh, I was like, okay, let's take a look at it. See what you got. And their numbers are nowhere near justifying it. It was like, Hey, if I win the lottery, I'll sell it. But, uh, I get, you get more of those at the beginning, but the guys that wait a little while, you can tell it was thought out. So I, I think, I think that's very true in that realm. And that's why, I mean, I guess my, my biggest piece of advice for somebody is, you know, get started because to build that backlog, of course, you have to you have to be going there. And I like you bringing up direct mail, too. You know, we even in our space consider direct mail as an option. It doesn't make a ton of sense. You know, you would assume people in our space are, in fact, you know, mostly dealing with their email. But one case where we thought it would be interesting, and I think one of the, the great tragedies of doing this is as you do it, you realize a million other good ideas that you can't really execute on because you just don't have the time. But for a lot of more legacy platforms, especially stuff that probably has been in operation since the early 90s and it's ready for a bit of a, a rebrand or a change to the way the product is delivered, those things um, might actually be more susceptible to a direct mail campaign or, or something more traditional in that way. And I think you'll see that with Main Street businesses, as you just mentioned, real estate. So what I would say is, you know, for people in your audience, anyone who's listening, if they're thinking about getting started on sourcing, don't think you have to match our exact process. You know, I think it's just the way of thinking is is good. Is where do, where do my sellers live? How am I going to contact them where they live? You know, how am I going to have an unfair advantage in finding them? And then uh, how am I going to engage with them the moment I have them? And for us, it was simplistic. Focus on our backgrounds, how we're very aligned with them, and then move to disqualification quickly, uh, so that we can spend all of our time talking with the qualified leads. And I like your you know idea of like you got to get your uh your deal flow or your your outreach going and got to keep it consistent um because you don't know when you're going to need the next deal and it takes time uh in the real estate space we were we were a small shop and uh we were in a very sophisticated 
realm of real estate, we were negotiating short sales. So at any given time, we could actually manage only about 30 to maybe 45, 50, if, you know, depending on who we had on staff negotiations. So we would run batches of, you know, direct mail. We'd fill up and we'd sign three, four people a week sometimes. And then we get to the point where we just couldn't negotiate anymore. So we'd have to shut the marketing off to slow it down. But you get this ebb and flow, flow thing of going when you need customers, there's a lead time to get people, get it churned back up and get the phone ringing again and everything else. So Absolutely. you would end up in these, you know, up and down cycles where you could have kept it even if you just figured out what that throttle was. If, you know, send send a little less and keep it steady as opposed to uh, turn it, you know, open the spigot all the way open. Okay, it's flooding. Shut it all the way down. Okay, it's dry. If, you know, uh, I think that happens in the in this space too is if you if you want deal flow, you need to figure out a, a, a way to get it steadily because uh, when you're ready to look at the next business, it may take a few weeks or even months for the right thing to come across. So Absolutely. Yeah, and I think it's, there's a, a number of different disciplines that come in and our, I, I am not going to say our flow has been completely consistent, right? It's pretty lumpy in different seasons. For instance, we shut down a lot of outreach at the end of Q4 because we're just like Christmas is not a great time to reach out to people. Um, so we focus on kind of reinvesting in some of the tooling or some of the existing conversations we were already having at that point. So there's going to be those patches during the year where you don't get um, a good, a good flow. I just think it's good to, you know, be honest with yourself is the reason I'm not doing this because I don't like cold outreach because a lot of people don't like it or is the reason you're not doing it because there's some kind of strategic reason not to do it. And I think you always should be. I've been just overwhelmed by how how powerful it's been. Right. I, I just I thought a lot of this was going to be for practice or for learning more about the market. I didn't realize we would actually get things under LOI through cold outreach. And, um, Absolutely. We uh you know, different industries are really easy to get online. I'm imagining the software companies would be the uh, when you look, we did a roll up last year. We were working on one and uh, we did 200 plus interviews of marketing agencies, almost 100 percent from LinkedIn. And you think about it, you know, almost every marketing agency, you know, if they're not on LinkedIn, there's probably a problem. Right. Uh, it's a B2B. They're looking for customers. Right. They want a decent present there. And then I turn around. I, I own a small pest control company. I'd love to grow it through acquiring other Tulsa or area, you know, based pest control companies. And out of the 40 or 50 that exist in Tulsa, maybe five of them have a presence on LinkedIn. Yeah. So it's, you know, depending on your industry, you have to shift your, uh, your, your sourcing. I agree with that. So let's yeah. talk about once you've okay we we've got the loi they've, they've signed it we're doing all that we've done all our due diligence now it's time to onboard them now it's time to uh like you just recently acquired it how how do you how do you go about bringing them on board and and uh integrating them in with all the other stuff you got going on i think for us we're we're definitely at a transition point because we are working on our largest deal right now and so that will be new for us so instead of Speaking of that, because I, I, I can't say for certain what will happen. I mean, what, what this is going to do is it's going to end up becoming a bigger part of our our whole, like, it, it's just going to be everything is going to switch to orient around this larger star. You know, it's the gravitational pool is big. We call um, it our anchor property. So you're buying your anchor yeah. now. Yeah. But one, one thing I can speak to is in our last acquisition, which was smaller and, and tucked right into our software development firm a lot better. And then I can also speak to one of our customers critically. And, and this is where I, I go to kind of more the customer side is he is a private equity group that is um, acquiring uh, manufacturing firms in Australia. And so we help them on some of their integration efforts on the technology side uh, purely as a vendor. But I think it's it's an interesting vantage point to look from uh, because we can, you know, we can be just clear eyed about it because it doesn't have much to do with our strategy and more about what they're trying to do in terms of the integration. So I'll speak first to our, um, our first acquisition, which is a, small properties called site alert and it's kind of like an uptime monitor for uh, different applications uh, we use it with all of our customers and it's got like a diversified customer base mostly in this kind of small business services realm and bringing that in was really a matter of getting the platform into our hands and a lot of tech handover <laughs> i mean the amount of accounts that we had to do which uh, always comes up especially when you do like an asset sale so there's going to be a, a reassignment of everything so a lot of account handoff, um, a lot of knowledge base handoff. We benefited from the fact that the tool itself was started by a developer. I am a developer. So him and I spoke up 
pretty similar language and, and I, I came to really appreciate him because it was actually quite decent code. Um, he did a really good job at the whole thing. So I think it was a little unusual in that regard because I wasn't inheriting a ton of problems. Uh, but we did keep him on for um, about, it was either 90 days or six months of consulting too, where we could do, we could mandate either two to three hours a week of his time just to look into specific things, or we could just hold that time for later and then um, use it up at the end of the six month period or whatever we wanted it. It went pretty well. Um, biggest thing was just making sure that we started utilizing it and um, onboarding our own customers onto the platform. And then, you know, just have a good strategy for how to deal with the maintenance and everything moving forward. Um, like I said, we benefited a lot from the tech being in good shape. Had it not been, I could have imagined like a more of a 90 day stabilization period where we would have focused on, uh, on, on getting the tech in better shape. You mentioned earlier something that really caught my ear. We talked about a little bit before the show, the fully remote management team, right? I've designed my entire life right now about being fully remote. I'm sitting in a redwood forest in California and my businesses are in Tulsa and, you know, I, some of my employees are in the Philippines and, um, but none of them are here. I don't have an employee within 1800 or, or somebody, a team member. Some of them are partners. I don't have one within a, probably 1500 miles of me. Tell me a little bit about like, I'm, I know that you do this also and I'm looking for lessons learned. Um, what, what do you like about the fully remote teams? And uh, is there any cool tools or things you use to manage your remote? Sure. Uh, yeah. So for us, I mean, this was a day one plan for us. So, my, I mean, the joke is my partner lives in Minneapolis. I live in New York. Both of us didn't want to take our kids out of their schools. So that meant neither of us were moving. Right. And uh, and so from the very beginning, we said, OK, this is going to be fully remote. But I think we embraced it more as a, a kind of cultural goal for the firm, too. Um, you know, the constrained hiring pool is really tough, especially in tech, right? So where I live, um, the kind of, for one thing, just the kind of ammunition you have to have to pay people the salaries they want in tech is, is pretty absurd. And you're, you're, you're usually competing with, I guess in New York, you're competing with a lot of finance, right? So you're competing with hedge funds and banks who, even if they look at software and software developers as a cost center, they frankly just have the money to pay for it. So there's an economic aspect to it, which is just, We'd rather be able to recruit all over the country, all over the world, as you've done too. And then once you do that, you there's there's a you know additional aspect I think is even more important than economic is we can just find the best people all over and really uh, put together a team that's still really dedicated to each other and yet uh, lives in different countries, different places. And one of the things we try to focus on is that team cohesion element to say, hey, we're remote, but we're we are a team. I think it would be a lot harder if we say had some New York or Minneapolis office that was meeting together every day and then everybody else was remote. Like, I think that would end up creating a bit of a two tier system. We don't have that. Right. So what we'll do is annual uh, company meetups. And, um, you know, it was supposed to be in the U S this year. Some of our people are having a hard time getting visas. So we're looking at uh, either Canada or Panama right now. I'm voting for Panama personally, but uh, mm-hmm. we'll probably, you know, we'll, we'll pick one of those soon enough. Um, beyond that, I think it's about, making sure that all the async methods of communication are really up to snuff. So uh, we use a lot of Slack and, you know, not in the way where we're trying to interrupt people's workflow. You know, we're trying to make sure people have time to really concentrate, really get into something, but also just the recognition that, hey, if you want someone's async feedback on something, Slack is really good for quick points of feedback. Um, And then our project management system is the reference point for everything. So we use ClickUp for that. Uh, it's a great tool. I think there's a lot of great tools. You know, I'm not like a click up, uh, devotee. I do like their pricing is pretty good. It's pretty good for a firm like ours and they have a lot of great features that I really like. So I've never, I do, oh, I've never heard of click up. I, well, I don't, what, what is it service that they provide? Um, it's, it's, it's really like, it's like an Asana or Jira, okay. or, um, something like that. Just a, it's a project management tool. So very, very horizontal SaaS market, <laughs> not the kind of market we would want to acquire in, but. ClickUp kind of came in, they're a bit of a venture funded behemoth, came into the market, did really well. I think they were really responsive in their feature design. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and my last secret, which is the big, big, big one that is, you know, I, I use this like nobody's business. It's just, I record screencasts, like, you know, but you know, maybe on some days, 20 to 30 times a day, right? And so I, you know, on any given week, there's hundreds of videos coming from me to different members of my team, showing them how to do things. You know, we try and make training materials to be evergreen, but also, hey, I'm just looking into this issue with the accounts receivable. Can you take a look at this and send it out to them? 
that's a really good way to just make sure we're a bit more time zone agnostic because we do have finance uh, functions in the Philippines and then we have uh, contractors in Indonesia as well who um, just are, you know, they want to work their normal hours and it doesn't really bother me. They're doing good work, so I'm not going to. Yeah, I started off with my Philippines team being on my hours and I had two of them uh, come back and, um, you know, they just, it just wasn't working. It was causing anxiety issues and other stuff because it was from midnight to 8 a.m. in the morning. Sure. And uh, I just, I, I, I did the same thing you did. You get your work done, you work the hours you, you, you work. And, uh, you know, we use Slack and Asana. And I use Asana in ways that probably wasn't designed Asana to, to, to use. Uh, my whole podcast production is a, uh, like, a assembly line in Asana. It's, uh, it's kind of fun as I, when you start with, you're being in, in, invited and it says like, I guess what they call them, scrum boards or whatever. It's yep. just a board. I just drag, you know, I drag it and then I've used third party automation tools to add tasks to it. So if I drag it from one column to the next, it adds all the tasks for that column and it reassigns it to whoever's responsible for that column. So all I have to do is look up today and go, who's on the record on restream? Cause that's the only part I do. I record yeah. it, I click the okay buttons and then I drag it to edit and it, you know, gets assigned to Mariel and her team and they edit it and then she drags it off to she, her team does everything from that. It's mostly her right now. So, uh, but yeah, so I think there's a lot of good tools out there for that. And I love the fact that you're saying it's just not, it's not two tiered. We had a lot of the marketing agencies we talked to that were going to go back to a kind of hybrid. And uh, it's like during the pandemic, some of their employees were, okay, they were okay with it. It wasn't like they moved away. I almost said that a lot of their employees moved away. Was, that would sound like they didn't, the, the, the CEO didn't know. They were okay with it during that. And now they're thinking about coming back to the shop and now they've got people in seven different states, right? Yeah. So they're going to go to a hybrid model. I was like, yeah, I don't know. You know, I, th I think that can cause some problems in the fact that there's this us and them. Yeah. And I mean, may, you, I would make the case for it if you had teams doing just completely different things and they just don't really have to interact. But I, I'd be very concerned about the actual, um, yeah, the actual viability of what happens there. And, you know, I think this is more of a maybe philosophical kind of observation here, but uh, or, you know, work philosophy. I don't think it's like general philosophy, but. I think that the remote kind of revolution brought by COVID, and it was already underway in some professions anyway, um, I think it is now selecting for different management styles. And I think the returns to charisma are going down. Um, and the returns to um, organization, like organizational abilities are really uh, going up, right? So, you know, I knew a lot of managers in the kind of office era of my life, you know, in New York City, who it seemed like they're the big thing they brought to the equation was being a person who is like very vibrant and lively in person. And that just doesn't translate as well, um, you know, over Zoom. It's great when you have that once a year offsite. That's an awesome person to have getting everybody together. But the thing that does translate well is now a person who is very organized about everything they're doing. Just like <laughs> you just said, where you, you're able to get your team in the Philippines doing all this work because you've got Asana doing these tasks in an automated way that is very standardized and you have a good procedure around it. So those kind of things, I think it's just, those were always valuable in my mind. Like I always think those people were very process oriented were underrated historically, but now the benefit on that is just flown through the roof and the benefit on Christmas has gone down a bit. I don't think I had a choice. I'm extremely ADD and very disorganized. And when I was looking at the way I was managing this stuff was not getting done. So I needed like one of these, if I do it right once and I, you know, I lay it out how I want it done. Then all people have to do is, okay, this puzzle piece goes here at this time. You know, the who needs to do what by when, uh, as long as I've got that defined, everything is done. And uh, so it was organized by necessity. Uh, and I started this remote work thing, uh, you know, like having people all remote. I want to say 99, 2000. Uh, I moved to Oklahoma in 2007. So probably 2004, 2005, 2006. I had an entire web development team you know, in India, creating an online dating service that failed miserably and used up most of my funds at the time. <laughs> but uh, it was out of necessity. And I think that that's what's going on right now. COVID made it a necessity. So it sped it up. I think we were going there anyway. So I agree. We were probably going there anyway. And then the, um, you know, like I moved back to here to California. I was talking to one of my friends and, you know, the job I used to do many years ago at Lockheed Martin was a software test engineer. So for, for computer security stuff. So I would, 
they would build it, I would break it. You know, I tried to break the code. I tried to hack into it. I got to work on some really cool, like I, my job was to break into firewalls and stuff. And, uh, and unfortunately you got to eat, you know, eat, sleep and live computer security or you're out of, out of touch with how it works now. Yes. And that was 20 something years ago, but there's a thought that crossed my mind when they told me what they're paying those engineers now here. Uh, it's high six figures. It's crazy yeah. what they have yeah. to pay to get an engineer in the Silicon Valley within 400 miles of here to actually take a job. Um, it's, you know, I, I know one software engineer, he's a high level software engineer, but he's got a salary of $450,000 a year. And I was like, hmm, buying and selling business has got plenty of money. But if you paid me that and I was working for somebody else, I might be interested in going back. <laughs> so it's, it's crazy. I don't think you could, without the VC, if the VC, the VC funds dry up, if you know, which I don't know that they will. You know, there's a lot of dry powder out there right now. Um, it might actually start moving but things being on sale, it might actually be the opposite of drying up. It might actually, people want to get engaged and buy things when they're on sale. So uh, I think it's a wait and see on that. But for for what's going on in the world and the fact that everybody's comfortable with remote work, I think it's going to be, you know, if you're a listener out there, you're looking at buying business and you're concerned that the business you're looking at has most of its employees overseas, all that's doing is expediting where you probably should be anyway. Um, yeah. And I and I'm a big believer of U.S. made and and you know buying things here and building things here. But you've also got to run a business. The numbers got to make sense. And uh, you know I think there's certain key people that I always probably will have nearby. But um, there's also different sub markets where it's it's very hard to find people in the U.S. Right? I mean that's the whole issue is that you look in certain things like um, I mean the VA or accounting. You know the business services stuff you get in the Philippines is like. It's really good, right? This is not, um, the narrative can often be like, oh, they're going to a low cost provider. And it's like, this is actually a highly skilled <laughs> provider that is cost competitive, right? Um, but for me, the number one thing isn't cost. And I know that's the case because we tend to recruit in Latin America because we want that time zone overlap. And those aren't the cheapest markets to be in, of course. Oh. Um, you know, for software development, you know, it's debatable what the cheaper markets are, but you, you know, I think Pakistan would be in the running uh, certainly some countries in Northern Africa, uh, you know, these days, if you can get into Russia, that's a very affordable market, uh, you know, Belarus, places like that. But, you know, for us, we're looking at, we want a good, talented labor force that we, we can afford, but not like bottom of the barrel, obviously. And that's the thing that we've really been happy with is I say, you know, the best engineer in the U.S., or let, let's put it even this way, like a lower level engineer at Google is not likely to come work for me and I probably can't afford them. But the best right. engineer in Uruguay, I could afford, right? And there's a reality to that that is pretty cool. And probably it flatlines in, in the long term, especially in Mexico. We're seeing a lot of the rates flatten out. But um, that's fine by me. My, my biggest thing is I just need a labor pool, not not a super low cost labor pool. The well, funny thing is I got a call uh, for an interview because uh, I also work for Excite, which was, uh, I don't know if I can say this or not, but was during September 11th, some of the... Um, the terrorist or whatever you were using email servers and they came in and took a look at ours at Excite. And I ran the, uh, I was their senior director of operations and the email servers were working for me. So I, I ran the email servers that were involved with that. And then I had all these remote workers from around the world. I got an interview over the phone as to uh, <laughs> why I'm wire transferring money to the Ukraine and to the. What you exactly know. you're up to? Yeah. Yeah. What, what exactly you got going on here? I see, you know, they were looking at, you know, I, uh, you know, I was like, okay, I'm a person of interest to what? But uh, and once I answered everything, I said, man, I'll, come on over here. I'll open up my bank accounts and show you. I'll show you the software. Yeah, yeah. I don't mind whatsoever. And they never bothered me again. But, uh, you know, it was just a touchy time to have money going everywhere. Um, but I honestly think that the, if you're limiting to, like, if I were to start any type of company that needed software here, the kind of funds you'd have to raise in the Silicon Valley to do that would just be 10 X in what it would be if you look globally for your staff. Yep. Yep. Cool. And there's, diff I mean, there's different, like you said, there's different levels. There's people you're going to keep stateside for certain reasons. We've definitely seen that in government. So we did a limited sourcing campaign. Um, in government services. And, and the realization was we'd have to just underwrite for a totally different salary structure uh, because we, we would have so many limitations on that. 
yeah. you know, the advantage you get, you know, you talk about recession proof, that tends to be one of those kind of recession proof businesses, right? So it's yeah. uh, usually a, a limited upside, but also very limited downside is the way we thought about the government work. Yeah, I guess if you're buying defense contracting companies or something that has encryption, even, I think there's all kinds of laws around encryption as to where you, where it can and can't go and all that stuff. So you'd have to, you'd have to do that. Let's talk, um, let's just kind of look at what's your end goal here? Uh, are you uh, a holding company? Is that what you want to do? You want to buy, acquire a hold for long term, grow these? You're going to take them public at some point. Um, you have a game plan already? Yeah, sure. So I think, I think we, you know, my partner and I temperamentally are into the hold co model, but that's also very on trend right now. And um, we're early for that, to be honest. It's, it's not, we don't have to decide that just yet. Mm-hmm. And so what we want to focus on is being really good. Uh, and what we do. And there is this kind of this kind of weird two-step that you have to do. I mean, on one hand, the area we are experts in is software, so we, we will continue to be experts in that. But the sub-market we're in, you know, we're kind of new to it, right? Um, and as a result, I think I'm going to spend a lot of the next three to four years just trying to double down on that market and see if we can really rise to have a level of thought leadership in it, which I think would then translate into you know, more opportunities there, especially if you think about like doing roll-ups, you know, tuck-ins and bolt-on kind of acquisitions, right? Starting to know what's going on in the market. And I'm, I'm excited about that because I think it's been a while in my career since I've really been able to just double down on something for the sake of it. Uh, you know, being in, working in the New York City kind of banking and media environment as I did for so many years, it was great because I got to see and do a lot of things. Um, you know, I had two consulting companies, right? And I worked for one prior to that. So I've been all over the consulting map and that gives you great experience, but it also means you kind of end up in this jack of all trades situation. You know, the one trade that I was always doubling down on software and technology, that was the thing I always knew, but you know, I know financial services, I know streaming technology, I know fraud detection and streaming. I know a little bit about the education space. You know, I know a bit about consumer products. Like there's a lot of things. And so it'll be nice when we get into a specific B2B market to say, all right, this is our B2B market, you know, we're going to go to this conference now during the year. We're going to focus on this. We're going to write white papers in this topic. And um, I'm a little excited about that. So that's like a kind of a different direction to go. But I think the next three to four years, we'll be talking about that. And if that market is big enough for us to just focus on, then we just keep doing things in that market. And we have we have a hold code that's focused on it. And if it's not, um, then we, we start to say, okay, what's, what's adjacent or what's something nearby that we will continue to get more interested in? I think... I think we're in a B2B SaaS for the long haul um, because we like, we just like the rhythm of that. We like the defensibility of it, the fact that it's not super volatile the way consumer products are. And, uh, and I think we've got, we've got a good handle on it, but we'll see also what the market brings. I don't see the return of kind of like perpetual license software or, you know, some of these older models reemerging, but you know, I'm not outside the potential that there could be more crowdsourced or DeFi oriented models in the future. And we'd have to adjust accordingly. Yeah. Uh, those are some of the interesting things that are out there that DeFi and those type of things like that because you know that's just a totally different beast altogether in itself so uh, you know i don't i don't i looked into it a little bit i actually was looking at creating one for a particular reason and uh didn't do it just because the uh, the partners i was putting on that uh, it just didn't make sense at the time and and it's still new enough that um, there were just unanswered questions. So I uh, went with a standard LLC and did something totally different. But um, what other what other things are on the horizon that you see that can impact like your buying and holding stuff? Do you see anything else out there that you're kind of just keeping your eye on to see where it goes? Well, I think we're, okay, so just a couple, and this, this speaks to your background. I think we're headed toward a era for massive cybersecurity problems. Like I think there is a, just people don't people don't even realize it. We've had an uptick since 2020. I mean, I think 2020 had five times the number of cybersecurity incidents that were happening in uh, 2019. So people were already more aware of it. But it's it's hard to illustrate how many of these legacy systems are just kind of aging on the vine, and how many attackers are out there just waiting to go. So I think cybersecurity is not my specialization. But if I had that background, I would be very focused on that right now. And I think. I don't know that how much that's going to change our market. I think what's going to happen is there's going to be major cybersecurity issues just kind of uh, rocking the market constantly and therefore um, just causing new new weird pivots. Like 
major players will cease to exist almost overnight because of some huge kind of cybersecurity problem meltdown that happened. And that's like a weird thing to have in a market where you could have the possibility of having to steal market share and then all of a sudden a major player is more or less knocked out because of some cybersecurity incident and then um, a bit of a gold rush to go and get all their customers. That's something I see a lot coming up um, in software. I see, you know, U.S. is at a weird inflection point where we're um, I'm a big big on demographics. You know, we're getting older. We don't have as many new people. So they always said there was going to be the gray tsunami. Uh, and I think there's just going to be more of that. There's going to be more opportunities in both acquisitions because people are retiring and there's fewer buyers down there for them. And then also, um, you know, services uh, for that market. Those are two kind of like meta trends that I'm very, very focused on. I think it'll open up a lot of stuff for you guys too, because as people like me buy a lot of the a lot of those silver tsunami or, you know, the aging out market, um, they tend to be brick and mortar. They tend to be like they, they have their systems have been on for a long, long time, and uh, when guys like me get our hands on them, we start looking at moving them to, you know, cloud based solutions and software as a yep. service based solutions as opposed to some old Vax machine. <laughs> They, uh, I was looking at uh, a manufacturing uh, company not too long ago, and their newest computer in their building was probably 25, 30 years old. It was uh, they still they were still using uh, machines that were the old green text only uh, computer monitors, like that's what their time card systems and stuff were, and uh, old Wayne computers. I think it was a Wayne model, and uh, so yeah, I think there's gonna. I think the market will open up a little bit as these things change hands uh, and guys like me look at that and go, I don't want to make it, you know, it's more expensive to maintain that old archaic, you know, system that, you know, within its limitations than it is to just replace it with something that, you know, is cloud-based, you know, upgraded all the time. The security side, I, 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 I agree. Um, I interviewed uh, Gary, and I'm going to butcher his last name. Uh, Guy, Gary is the CEO of Real Defense. They acquire like fifty million dollar and up uh, software security companies, and they do it in a unique enough way that might be something you know because so many times they do it through uh, divestures, so they they're constantly looking for VC back things that just didn't you know yep. the, the unicorn turned out to be a Shetland pony. It's only making you know twenty five thirty million. It's never going to make them billions, so they want to sell it off. He's built a network of. Um, you know, contacts inside of all the VC firms and network inside of all the private equity companies and everything else. And uh, a lot of times these big Google companies and stuff, they buy something that has three or four product lines for the intent of only owning maybe one of them. And they either shut the other ones down or they sell it off. So uh, that may be another stream if you're out there looking for, you know, tech companies and stuff like that is a lot of times... Uh, what you would, would be a really great business for you and me, you know, was a side project, a side hustle for some company that a major corporation purchased. Absolutely. Yeah. We call those deals VC roadkill. I don't know if that's super friendly to the deals, but uh, <laughs> that's the, 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 the quiet name we use for it. And we have looked at a couple of those. I mean, the thing about it that we, I think we see that in the future for us because what we want to do is get our playbook a little better because those are, tend to be, if not distressed, they have all the characteristics of a distressed deal because you have to you have to uh, lay off staff. You have to do a lot of repositioning very quickly. Um, so we started more with a calmer thesis about let's do businesses that are pretty stable, you know, growing, you know, have some uh, margin of safety. But I think we are, we're headed that direction in part because we see the opportunities. I mean, I, I'm still thinking of one product we looked at in the um, in the oil and gas space earlier this year. That was it was it was an unbelievably cool product. Uh, just couldn't couldn't uh, hack it with the VC world. But uh, I think my partner and I spent, you know, probably more time than we needed to just trying to talk about how we can make it work. Right. Because it was a cool, a really cool idea. And so I think there, there is a lot of that, that super interesting stuff. Out there. Yeah. I'm always cautious to, uh, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not looking for anything that's a turnaround or, you know, or to fix anything that's broken mainly because uh, I always joke around the fastest way to, to make a small fortune is from a big one. Right. Yeah. Uh, you can hurt yeah. yourself really fast by trying to fix somebody else's mistake uh, to where if you grab something that's up running, cash flowing positive and working and you can improve on it a little bit. It's yours to run, of course, but uh, yeah. you could you could screw it up really bad. But at least you're not dumping money into something that, you know, 
I have I, I just concern myself because I consider myself a fairly intelligent guy. And when you do that, sometimes you think you're smarter than the guy that was running that for 15 years. You can fix something he couldn't fix. Yeah. And you'll find out more often than not, my gut feeling is you're going to find out that there's more to it than you would, you know, could have ever imagine. And it's going to be harder to turn around than you thought. There are people out there. They're just, that's what they do. They just know how to turn things around. They know how yep. to, that, that's just not me. So, uh, um, I don't do turnaround either, either, uh, for the sheer purposes. I just don't have the team built around making sure it's successful. Maybe one of these days I'll build a team around it. It was just people I know have done it can do it again. And then, you know, you know, pick up things that the turnaround doesn't risk. I guess it's kind of like a risk portfolio thing. If you look at it and go that, you know, if I dump this money in it to turn this around, that's risking X number of percentage of my overall, you know, net worth or my overall portfolio of, you know, of businesses, you know, how long can I sustain that? And is it worth the risk? You know, what would happen if it turned around? Yeah, I guess that's a good way to think about it is, you know, it's, it's something you can do when it represents a smaller part of your net worth, but don't, don't bet the farm on turning something around. And I think what we would want to do, I think strategically what I'm just thinking about here is I would love to find kind of tuck in acquisitions that look like turnarounds. So that we can practice in a situation where if it doesn't work, we just ingest it into the larger organization. The customer list is still good, um, and that would be, you know, I, I think we we honestly believe in some cases that we would decommission a lot of software platforms because we love this market that hasn't really transitioned to the cloud um, as like a, a bolt-on or tuck-in market because we're just more than happy to say, hey, guess what, guys? You know, we're taking on your existing contract in three months. We need to transfer to the new platform. We'll build all the data transfer tools. So it really is like sunsetting a platform. Um, but we like that market because those guys, they can't, they can't get SaaS multiples. And a lot of times they're older, they're trying to, trying to move the business to a new home. They, you'd be amazed how many of these guys actually make sure their customers get taken care of is much more important than the money. Right. And, yeah. um, and that's something you could offer them if you said, Hey, we're going to give your, you know, right now your customers are on a sinking ship. We'll give them a life raft over to a new ship. And, uh, and that's just something that's going to have to happen. Those firms too, so that that's where I see us maybe starting to to apply some of those turnaround principles. Then maybe one day when we're feeling a little little glib about it, we'll uh, we'll give it a go on a, a big one. The other way, area to look for in the turnaround space is if they have a large customer pool of customers that you can upsell to and cross sell with your other platforms, right? Absolutely. So, you know, I. I I didn't want to like shoot anything. I don't do turnarounds. If you've got a company out there that's struggling, but you've got, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 uh, customers and, you know, they, they fall in something I already do. I would look at that just because, you know, the value of being able to sell those customers, my other products, my other, you know, the company's products um, would overweigh the fact that I'm going to have to fix some of the things with, you know, what what's setting on the table right there. So. Yeah. And, I, and the way I always think about it is like plan A strategy is we all get rich and we're super happy. Plan B strategy is we don't lose a ton of money. Right. Um, if you can make sure your plan B is just not that you, you know, yeah. are in really bad shape, that's probably good. I got it. Cool. So uh, I've asked you a bunch of questions. We've had a nice conversation here. It's uh, it's about 10 minutes to the end of the show. Let's do two things. What did I miss? Is there anything I like I should have asked you? Is there anything out there that uh, like, man, we probably should talk about this or. No, I, I, you know, we can't cover everything in every conversation. I think we had a good one. Uh, you know, we, a lot of what we talk about with firms might be useful to your audience as we're talking about at the end is, is this question of developing an automation strategy inside the firm. You know, it's going to be a mix of things. If you're using no software, uh, you're probably doing something wrong. I can't imagine a business right now that would use none. But one of the things we're, we're very focused on is what is going to be so unique about your, this goes back to the vertical software aspect but what's going to be so unique about your business that there's not actually going to be a product out there for you so we can admit that there's good crm solutions for keeping in touch with your sales contacts that's not a that's a solved problem but we tend to find that there's this uh i use the term from the postal service or logistics the last mile problem if you've ever heard of that like the last mile is the hardest to deliver and i always think of that the same with businesses on the technology front there's always something special that a company does that there's no tech to help them with that. And that's maybe the moment at which you start to think, do we build this as a competitive advantage? Do we build this as a strategic asset? And those tend to be the customers we work with. So thinking about that PE group in Australia who acquires manufacturing firms, or we work with an insurer not too far from you, probably maybe like 30 minutes from where you are right now in Lafayette, California. You know, these 
businesses have all figured out something unique about their business that they actually want to build technology around and then use that to power them. I have a friend who built a, uh, a software company around the insurance space because he started off as like, he just realized that inside of this space, there was no uniformed way to do these things across multiple agencies and stuff. So he built a software platform and actually uh, him and his company, you know, we were, I spent a year or so with him in the, in a, a team building program we were doing together and uh, him and his company um, started realizing there was no documented standards. You know, if you think about a lot of stuff, there's standard protocols and stuff that are written to do a certain thing, certain ways. So they wrote, wrote them up, submitted them to the industry, went to the industry conferences. And uh, you know, they're now they're, they own the software that, you know, follows these standards, but they actually are convincing the rest of the industry to, to stick to some standard uh formats of doing things so uh there's there's definitely uniqueness out there inside of different industries and like insurance has been around long enough you would think that nobody's been able to innovate how it's done in the last two or three years but there's companies doing it left and right so yeah and there's a sequencing problem we see a lot i mean i know that you're not trying to get to this at the end of the conversation but it's just fascinating to think that even if a firm, say an insurance firm, we see this a lot with law firms too, got online in the 90s, like maybe they were ahead of the game. Turns out they're probably aging out of the system now too. There is a cycle with this kind of thing. Um, so there's more to do. I mean, if you're if you're a young person today is trying to figure out what to do with your life, uh, you know, stay stay somewhat close to technology. And I definitely recommend the cybersecurity route. I think I'm, I'm actually telling my son to do that if he wants to do some kind of, um, you know, IT or software related field. I'm like, Cybersecurity is going to be in a golden age for 30 years, as far as I can tell. I was in it in, uh, in the 97 until about 2007. I did uh, computer security and just got burned out and uh, yeah. went and got a master's degree in marketing. But, um, you know, it was a big deal back then and it's a bigger deal now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's always going to be a problem. You know, this, this, the tools and stuff people are using to get into systems and the, and the vulnerabilities that we had back then are gone now, but there's a whole new set right so, absolutely always changing too so yeah. yeah that's that's about it and i would um commend your audience if they feel like i should have covered something else just you know shoot me a message and we'll talk cool how do they reach you what's the best way i've got your uh, your personal website underneath your name up here yeah uh, so my name.com brings you to it's really just a link tree i don't know if you guys know about this product but it's pretty cool you know i, I spent years always like updating a personal website and then it was you know out of date in six months because your life changes Linktree just lets you link out to the things that are important. So if you go there, you'll get my company sites, my LinkedIn, my Twitter, pretty much all the things that I would, um, you know, have people take a look at. If awesome. they want to shoot me a message on Twitter uh, or, you know, they can figure out my email address or one of our company email addresses from the site, too. They can also send me a message on LinkedIn. I'm happy to talk to anyone. Awesome. It's funny. I'll check out that link tree. Uh, I own uh, ronskelton.com and ronaldskelton.com, and I shut them down and routed them to my Facebook, uh, which was cool for a little while there because you know, I figured almost everybody on the planet has this one, but a lot of people are leaving it now. So I've had people go, hey, I was reaching out to you. I went to your ronaldskelton.com, and I don't have a Facebook, so I'm going to have to set up something. So link tree would probably uh, – I'll check that out and see what that looks like because I have no interest in it. Yeah, yeah I, I love it. And I only use the free version. I mean, yeah, I could use the paid version. They take the logo off, but it doesn't really matter to me that much. I just want to have like, here's what's going on right now. And if you take a look at these five links, that tells you everything about me at the moment. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I appreciate having you on the show today, man. Uh, I'm going to free you up and let you go back to doing what you're doing. Thank you for being here today. Uh, again, uh, if you're out there listening in the audience, you want to reach out to, to Trevor. Uh, it's Trevor. Uh, it's that is uh, for you guys that are just listening to the podcast you're driving, it's T R E V O R E W E N dot com. Uh, reach out to that. He has all the links on there. It'll be in the show notes. It'll be uh, 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 you'll be able to reach out and, and get a hold of him. And appreciate having you on here today. Cool. Thanks, Ron. Happy Fourth of July. Uh, yep. I'm going to end this hangout for just a second and we'll wrap this up. That's the show, guys. Hey, it's your host, Ronald Skelton. I want to thank you personally for watching the show today and invite you to call our new hotline, 918-641-4150. That's 918-641-4150. Call us and tell us about our show, ask questions, uh, suggest a guest, or even tell me about a business you have for sale and we'll reach back out to you. Again, that number is 918-641-4150. Call our hotline and leave us some information. Thank you.
The Investors and Entrepreneurs Professional Mastermind. The Investors and Entrepreneurs Professional Mastermind combines the traditional peer-to-peer mastermind introduced first in Napoleon Hill's famous book, Think and Grow Rich, with accountability partnering where your peers help you ensure that you set goals, take actions, and get results. If you want to scale, blow past roadblocks, and achieve success faster than you might think is possible, I suggest you take a visit over to TIEPM.com. That's T I E. PM.com and check out the Investors and Entrepreneurs Professional Mastermind.